Broadcasting from Manhattan Beach and the World Wide Web, you're listening to CHSR, HealthyLife.net. As a service to our listeners, this program is for general information and entertainment purposes only. CHSR HealthyLife.net does not recommend, endorse, or object to the views, products, or topics expressed or discussed by show hosts or their guests. We suggest you always consult with your own personal, medical, financial, or legal advisor. Greetings, or may I say Bojo and Potawatomi, to those joining us for today's Indigenous Perspectives show. I'm Randy Kritkowski, an enrolled Potawatomi tribal member and the co-host of Indigenous Perspectives. And I'm Carolyn Schmidt, the other co-host. Indigenous Perspectives originates from Vermont in the United States and is located on lands that the Abenaki people call Andakina. It's the unceded traditional territory of the Abenaki, who for thousands of years have been stewards of the lands found here and across the border in Quebec province in Canada. Our topic today is governance and nature protection in Canadian First Nations. We welcome Savannah Carr Wilson, speaking with us today from Victoria, British Columbia. Savannah is a Canadian lawyer who has spent the past several years working for Indigenous peoples, supporting them to protect the environment in their traditional territories and also to address their governance needs. She has a law degree from the University of Victoria in British Columbia. She also has a master's degree from the European Erasmus Mundus MESPOM program in environmental science and policy. So welcome, Savannah. Great. Um, thanks so much, Randy and Carolyn, for having me on your podcast. And uh, just before starting, I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm currently speaking to you from the beautiful, unceded traditional territories of the Lekwungen peoples, known as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, uh, which is on the west coast of Canada in what is now known as Victoria, British Columbia. Thank you. So, Savannah, let's start off with your background, how and why you became interested in the issue of tribal governance. Is it related to your background in environmental policy, or did you have to make that bridge? Sure. Uh, So I would say my interest in tribal governance and environmental law and policy uh, go hand in hand, and they've evolved together. So maybe I can first explain my background a little bit, and as part of explaining that, I'll talk about how I became interested in and also came to work on um, tribal governance and environmental law and policy. So I would say it all, um, it all really started when I was in law school at the University of Victoria training to be a lawyer um, some years ago, uh, because this was when I uh, first had the opportunity to work for an Indigenous government. Um, So when I was in my second year of law school, I had the chance to participate in an environmental legal clinic at the University of Victoria. And this was a really unique, very quite cool clinic that paired um, supervised students with First Nations governments um, who were clients. And we had the opportunity to help them with their environmental um, legal issues, which sometimes also tied into governance. Uh, and I thought I just, there was one sort of interesting example. Um, one of my files was actually to help a First Nations government located in BC's north, uh, which had a huge amount of fracking for natural gas happening in their territory. Um, because for some years, fracking has been a big industry in British Columbia. Uh, and, and just to give some sort of color to this situation, um, uh, this, this fracking was generating a massive amount of wastewater that gets pumped into disposal wells in the ground. Um, and that was happening in this nation's traditional territory. Um, and I, I remember there was one well, and it had been operating for, for 50 years. And we came up with the visual that uh, the amount of, of wastewater that had gone down into that well was equal in volume to 24 towers the size of the uh, former 9-11 World Trade Center towers. It's a really huge amount of wastewater. 
Um, so, so essentially, I, I wrote a, a research paper for this nation that they then used to advocate for better regulations around wastewater disposal. So advocating for safer disposal of the wastewater. And they were successful. So they were able to change, um, really change those laws and have better practices um, taking place in their territory. So that that experience um, gave me a sense of how meaningful it was to work for Indigenous nations as clients and also what powerful leaders um, these governments could be on environmental issues. Uh, and that was also one of my first introductions to the rich variety of tribal governance structures that such nations are operating under um, in Canada. So just, just to continue on a bit... Um, and bridge to the other part of my experience. After I, I got my law degree from the University of Victoria, uh, I wanted to specialize further in environmental law and policy. And that's when I won a scholarship to study my Master of Environmental Science and Policy in the European MESPOM program, which is quite a unique program. It's a master's degree that's uh, funded by the EU, and it's jointly taught at several European universities in uh, Hungary and Greece and Sweden and the UK. Um, and, uh, uh, while I was getting that master's degree, I, I took on a project. I researched and wrote a book with a fellow student, um, called Total Transition. And it was about the global transition from fossil fuels to renewables and how this transition would impact workers and communities that depend on fossil fuels for their livelihoods. Um, so as part of that book, again, there was a connection back to, um, working with or I guess speaking to um, Indigenous governments, because we we did some research in the Indian coal mining belt, but we also went to the Canadian oil sands. Uh, and we had the opportunity to speak to several um, representatives of First Nations governments there about how that development was impacting uh, them, both damaging um, their traditional territories, but also wiping out other forms of livelihood, uh, such as fur trading, which had, you know, been a form of livelihood before, so that uh, there was this dependence on the oil sands for economic opportunities. So, kind of a, a catch twenty two. Um, so, I guess uh, that that work in my master sort of further cemented my interest in like working for Indigenous clients and and working on environmental issues after my master's. That's a great explanation. I'm going to get you before yeah. we go too far to back up. You okay. mentioned something in passing that for certainly non-Canadian listeners and even most Canadian listeners is a really complicated issue. And we, we talk about tribal governance and people might have some notion of something like municipal governance or state or provincial governance. But my understanding is that it's a lot more complicated um, when you're dealing with indigenous people because you have governance structures that were created by the government, and then you have traditional informal governance structures of all kinds. Without taking us too far into the weeds, could you explain a little bit in your own words your acquaintance with those different structures? Uh, sure. Um, well, I think uh, I can give sort of a, an overarching um, explanation of, of what we see in Canada. Um, and, and also mention a little bit my experience of working with, with some of those, um, governments. So in Canada, and I, I would imagine this is also the case in the U.S. as well, although my, my experience is certainly more in, in Canada, uh, there's a really a wide variety of Indigenous governance structures. Um, and I, yeah, I can briefly speak to those that I've worked with. Um, although I should mention that it's not, it's definitely not an exhaustive description of all of the indigenous governance structures in Canada. There really is a, a very rich variety um, of governance structures that have evolved. Uh, but I would say there's, there's really what I've experienced. There's two main categories. Um, and one is uh, governance structures that were sort of create or shaped by the, the colonial state. So the, the you know federal and provincial government of Canada um, and one of the main structures you see in Canada is something called um, Indian Act bans. Uh, and I'll explain what that is. So the Indian Act, um, it's a it's a piece of Canadian federal, it's, it's a Canadian federal law that dates back to the 1800s. Um, and it was one of the main tools that was used to um, oppress and assimilate Indigenous peoples in Canada for many years. 
So, for example, that's how the government, um, through this law, banned things like the potlatch and suppressed um, or made it illegal for First Nations people to practice their culture um, back in the 1800s. And uh, it's changed a lot over the years, but it actually still exists today. There still is an Indian Act, although it's it's changed and, you know, things like the ban on practicing the potlatch are, are no longer in there. Um, but basically, coming back to governance, uh, what what this act did is it um, it it said, you know, to to an indigenous community, you cannot um, follow your traditional structures of governance anymore. Uh, you know, you need to follow this colonial governance structure. Uh, you need to have a chief and council, and they're going to be elected, and that's going to be your your governance structure um, from now on. So that was what, and and, and you're going to rule over a reserve. Um, I think in the U.S. it's reservation, but in Canada it's reserve, which was a very small, like sort of postage stamp piece of the the traditional territory that this Indigenous people had before. Um, so that structure was put in place around the 1800s, and it, it does continue to endure today. Um, many communities still use that structure of having a chief in council. Um, uh, and, and that's what's in place on, on many, um, reserves in Canada is this chief and council structure. Um, there is another sort of category though, which is, uh, governance structures that are defined by Indigenous peoples themselves. Um, and that might involve leaders who are elected or it might involve leaders who are hereditary, where, um, their authority is passed down by descent, uh, or it might involve a mix, um, because there really is a rich variety. Uh, so just maybe to give two examples to give some color to that. Um, I worked for one Indigenous nation in BC that organized itself as a tribal council. Uh, it was made up of several communities. So one nation, but several communities. And each of those communities had a chief. All of the chiefs sat on the tribal council. And then they elected a tribal chair, um, who was the, I guess, supreme leader of the the nation. And these chiefs were making decisions individually for their communities, um, but also making big collective decisions for the nation sitting as, as tribal council. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's one example. And, and of course, there's many more examples in the wide variety of, um, how Indigenous peoples govern themselves in Canada. Thanks. I think that was, was, was useful filling in the background. Now let's shift to the question about how are Indigenous governments in Canada asserting their own laws to protect their people and the environment? Can you comment on what kind of approaches are working well? And also, what are some of the roadblocks that you've seen that stand in their way? Uh, definitely. Um, I think that's a really interesting question um, because there is a wonderful um, revitalization of Indigenous law that's occurring in Canada right now. Um, there's actually several organizations and research departments at universities who are working with um, Indigenous communities to uh, affirm their laws, which which already exist, but sort of go through a process of affirming them and in some cases write them down and help apply them in, in modern um, ways. Uh, so there's kind of a, a process of... Um, uh, revitalizing Indigenous people's own laws and also some Indigenous governments that are using Western pathways to make laws to deal with modern concerns like COVID. Um, so maybe I can give some examples of both. I think we've seen some interesting examples um, in, in in BC specifically recently. Uh, so one, one example of uh, an Indigenous government kind of um, using their own laws and following their own process to to make um, make environmental change, I would say, uh, is there was a, um, a First Nation in BC that recently did their own environmental assessment of a proposed mine, and that mine was ultimately cancelled. Um, and just to give a little bit of background, uh, before you have a major development like a mine or a hydro dam in Canada, you have to go through an environmental assessment process where different aspects of the project are looked at um, before this thing is approved and it's built. Um, so, and I should say for this example, this is just what I've, I know pub- is known publicly about this project. Um, I didn't work directly with these clients. So I'm just, um, 
mentioning what is sort of publicly out there. Um, but it's a very interesting story. So I guess to briefly describe it, there was a company, I think it was a Polish company, who wanted to build a really big gold and copper mine near Kamloops, which is a medium-sized town in central BC. Uh, and they actually wanted to build it right on the outskirts of the town, which had other issues with it. Um, but also on top of a, um, a site of great cultural importance to a First Nation. Um, and that nation was the uh, Te Kamloops Te Sequep Inc., um, or sometimes it's abbreviated as SSN um, nation. So this nation uh, did not think that enough planning was being done about this project, that the government wasn't looking at it um, carefully enough. This project that was going to destroy their their cultural keystone site. Um, so they did. The, they decided, you know, the government's assessment is not good enough. We're going to do our own indigenous assessment under our own laws. Uh, and they did. Um, they had their own review process. They took their own decision and wrote their own report, gave it to the government, and the government uh, refused to permit the mine in the end. Um, so quite a cool example of a, an Indigenous nation um, following their own governance process according to their own laws. And then I think like having this powerful um, impact, right, of this mine not being built. Okay. Um, were there, the were there other factors that came into play as to why this this First Nations group in Kamloops was successful. Was there publicity about the problems that this would pose? Was would they get like different legislators or different, you know, different other people in on it? So yeah, um, a great great question. There, I think I think what helped in part, um, certainly there was publicity, and part of that was that there was a lot wrong with this project from the start. Um, and there was a couple competing projects that were very notorious in the province at the time. And I, you know, perhaps this was the, the worst of all the options and the easiest to let go of. Uh, but as I said, it was a, you know, a, a giant mine that was proposed to be built right on the outskirts of one of BC's largest towns. So that's going to have, um, issues with traffic, with noise, with, you know, impacting water quality and, and so on. Um, and and also this this nation which had these you know very very legitimate concerns about how it would impact its traditional territory, and uh, I believe it was it was going to destroy a um, a lake um, a lake of great cultural importance to the nation. So th- this is encouraging news because we often read about indigenous people being on the losing end of these kinds of things. It's nice to hear that sometimes they're on the winning end. Is there an example you can give us of applying traditional, even unwritten tribal law and getting it recognized in the mainstream? Or is that pushing the envelope too far? Yeah. Um, I mean, I would even say that uh, that this example I, I just gave um, related to the environmental assessment was a way of applying um, sort of more traditional or, or unwritten um, laws. I know from what I've read that that was woven into the um, environmental assessment and I guess way of looking at the project and way of doing things when it came to the environmental assessment. Uh, for example, I think, um, you know, they made like a committee to to um, have experts come before them to tell them about the project, uh, you know, both Western experts and traditional ecological knowledge experts. And I, I believe that there was, um, there was leadership on the committee, so community leadership, but there was also, um, family representatives from each of the major families of each of the major communities, um, that made up this nation. Uh, so in, in a way, this was the nation who sort of following their own, their own process and, and perhaps, um, although I don't, I don't know this directly, their own, uh, un, unwritten laws. This is this is exactly the next topic that we were going to raise, and I think we're going to carry it over to the next segment after the break, and that is the role of traditional ecological knowledge or tech. We read about it a lot in the mainstream media, a lot in scientific journals, and you know, it, it is it is becoming more and more influential. The public doesn't necessarily understand it, and 
I would like after the break for you to explore that with us and help us understand how it dovetails with and sometimes challenges mainstream science and policymaking. And we'll do that after the break. Thanks a lot. Great. Okay, so we'll be back in a few minutes with Savannah Carr-Wilson from Victoria, British Columbia. Stay tuned. Rights for Nature? Around the globe, indigenous communities, governments, and environmental groups are realizing that human rights aren't enough to protect the planet. They're passing laws that recognize rivers, forests, and mountains as having rights of their own, rights that include the right of those ecosystems to exist and flourish. These actions are beginning to make a real difference. Find out more about this work by visiting the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights webpage at Center for Environmental Rights. Org. Period poverty. If you don't know what it is, you should because you can help. One in four American women struggle to purchase menstruation products this year, resulting in missed school and even loss of income. The Native American women's nonprofit, Quek Society, cares enough to give Native American students and communities their period products, and they do it across North America. Please help women with your time, donations, or supplies to maintain their dignity and celebrate their strength during moon time. Visit QuekSociety.org. That's K-W-E-K Society. Listen up. The source for information and inspirational items about the struggle and wisdom of indigenous people is the Syracuse Cultural Workers. They are committed to peace, sustainability, social justice, feminism, and multiculturalism, and they create beautiful visual materials like calendars, t-shirts, cards, and more, including their greetings and thanks to the natural world, according to poster that offers daily grounding for our relationship to the earth and its many fellow beings. Get so many wonderful items. Go there now. SyracuseCulturalWorkers.com Randy Krakowski's book, Without Reservation, describes his spiritual awakening as a Native American. It's a powerful, life-changing story where Randy shares his journey into the realm of ancestral Native American connections and explores his encounters with Mother Earth. The book actually helps you how to reconnect with your ancestors to rekindle your access to ancestral wisdom and nature. Available in print, ebook, and audiobook format, Get Without Reservation by Randy Krakowski from all major booksellers. For more information, visit Randy Krakowski. Citizen Potawatomi Nation's Cultural Heritage Center, located near Shawnee, Oklahoma, features 11 immersive galleries with digital and interactive exhibits. Visitors learn about the tribe's history from origin to modern days and gain an understanding of citizen Potawatomi oral traditions and lifeways. Admission is always free. Open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturday 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Visit the Cultural Heritage Center on the web at PottawatomieHeritage.com. Welcome back to Indigenous Perspectives. We're speaking with Savannah Carr-Wilson, and we're just wrapping up some comments on traditional ecological knowledge and how it is used in the Canadian legal context. So over to one of you. Senator, why don't you give us, you know, the sort of wrap up on how that gets involved in the environmental impact assessment. And I'm going to use that to jump off to our next topic. Sounds good. Uh, so I would say that that more and more uh, there is um, definite interest in incorporating traditional ecological knowledge into the sort of colonial government decision making. Uh, just to give one example, we already talked about environmental assessments, but, um, you know, for a, a major project like a mine, that's going to take into account a lot of Western science. But now the, the legislation says you also need to take into account traditional ecological knowledge. So it's written down that that needs to be part of what the decision maker is looking at. Um, but I would say it's still a bit of a gray area how they look at it. How is it really incorporated? And sometimes the nations providing that traditional ecological knowledge might have the feeling it's not really being incorporated into the decision. So I think there's still some room for um, improvement there. <laughs> 
Thanks. So that that kind of ambiguity in interpreting the law brings me to my next question, which grows out of my own experience of literally decades of working as an environmental activist in the United States. And I remember coming to the realization, and it was rather shocking at the time, that the people who show up with clipboards, you know, the enforcement people, um, are actually involved in an enormous amount of discretion, but they're working with regulations. And the regulations aren't exactly the same as the law. And most people don't understand that. So I'm hoping that you can help us to comment on how indigenous people play a role in creating or not the laws that affect them, but equally importantly, those regulations that interpret the laws that tell them how they're going to make their environmental impact assessment. Is the Native American voice there? Is it at the table or is it silent? Well, you gave Savannah about 10 questions. (laughs) Savannah, just pick and choose with any one of them and we'll go from there. Sure, sure. Um, So I think that's, there's, there's a lot to unpack there and that's really fantastic. Uh, You know, for a long time in, for example, British Columbia, which is where I work in Canada, so let's say Western Canada, um, environmental law, to use that as, as an example, um, it was all about, you know, use the resources, okay? Like develop the country um, The you know, uh, it's already Indigenous people's country, but this is, you know, Western settlers coming in, develop the country, use the resources. So like our water laws were all about, you know, use it or lose it. Uh, use that water, you're going to lose the right to, to use it. Um, oil and gas, right? Pump that well, or you're not going to have the right to pump that well anymore. And uh, there really was, you know, very little to no, um, let's just say no um, consultation with Indigenous peoples about these these laws that were layered on top of their own laws and were affecting them. Um, you know, that has changed. Uh, now there are um, consultation processes for making laws. When a new law is made, there's a big consultation process and Indigenous governments' voices are heard either in meetings or they can send in, you know, written submissions. So I think it really is, um, it is changing. Uh, it is changing for the better. Um, and there's, there's actually some very neat uh, kind of organic um, interrelationships that have developed. So we have... Um, up and down the coast, there's a lot of coastal guardian um, programs. And that's where an Indigenous nation um, uh, has uh, members who are working as guardians. They're going out on boats or they're going out into the forest and they're helping with enforcement. Um, so they're they're seeing, you know, what laws are being followed, what aren't. Are people getting too close to grizzly bears? Um, that sort of thing. And they're helping um, to enforce laws. And that's, that's really, um, uh, I think it's really helping with enforcement. And it's a great source of employment in Indigenous communities, and it's just in general a win-win. Those are marvelous examples. I wish I could give you more from this side of the border, um, but I think Canada is a little more ahead of the curve than we are Mm -hmm. on this side. Why do you think that is? Has the atmosphere changed in the decade because of the the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, or has it been a longer-term development? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a really great, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think there's, there's probably many dimensions to the answer. And as a lawyer, you know, it's sort of like when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I would give more of a legal answer, which is that the legal landscape, um, has really changed. Uh, for, for example, um, in 2014, there was a, a landmark legal case. In, in in Canada, but it actually happened in BC called um, Silkatine, uh, and it was a, a nation um, who actually I uh, did briefly work for um, that uh, won Aboriginal title to part of their traditional territory. So they they you know the the court said in a way you own um, a very large piece of land uh, in the center of BC. You have Aboriginal ownership of that land. And it's a bit more complicated than that. I won't get into the details, but that really, you know, it, it shook the foundations of the relationship between Indigenous peoples and uh, uh, the the government um, in Canada. Uh, you know, now we have Indigenous peoples who have this ownership right and they can pass their own laws. And um, 
you know, it, it changed the power balance. And there's been other court cases like that that have also changed the power balance, bringing us to this up, this different place that we're in today. Can you stop right there for a moment? Because you just explained something that I think our listeners have heard many times but never appreciated before, which is the meaning of unceded territory. On this side of the border, it's a moral claim. But I think if I heard you correctly, and if I remember Canadian law correctly, in Canada, unceded has a new and deeply important political and legal meaning because it literally means the sovereignty isn't a moral claim that's nice. It's a real claim. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I would say so. Um you know, we talk about unceded territory, for example, in our, our land acknowledgements, right? That the, the land I'm on is unceded. And that means that the, um, the nation whose territory it is has never, um, never gave it away. It was, you know, it was in many ways taken from them, um, if it, if it was taken. Uh, but in Canada, there's many different ways that nations are reclaiming their land. Um, outside of the, the reserve. So we already talked about the postage stamp that the government said, you know, this is your territory. So outside the postage stamp. Um, one of the ways is these big court claims and they can get Aboriginal ownership to that land, uh, that, you know, unceded land, which is now coming, coming back to their ownership. And there's other ways too. I won't go into all of them, but there's, we have something called modern treaties in Canada. And that's a, a government that a nation negotiates, um, with the government where they, they talk about, um, essentially, uh, uh, what, what land they're going to own and how they're going to own it. This is, this is a huge development. And when one looks at the territory of Canada, we're not talking about postage stamp areas here. We're talking about some rather significant territory. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, I don't recall the, the exact size. Um, of the silk team claim, but it was thousands of um, kilometers, a very, very large, um, very large piece of, of what, was, was this land that had a lot of white settlement and, you know, cities and roads and factories and things on it? Or was this land that was basically sparsely populated by the non-Indigenous Canadians? Yeah, um, I, uh, I don't know about that in, in such detail, but I would say I think it's somewhere in the middle. Um, there certainly was some use and settlement and private ownership, uh, but it wasn't, for example, you know, in the middle of the city of Vancouver, which is our, our biggest city in BC. And I think when we look at, at highly populated areas, things get more complex. Thanks okay. for making that yeah. distinction. This yeah. has been really very clarifying. Thanks a lot. Um, and this is we need to end segment two and we'll be back in just a minute. Stay tuned. Rights for nature. Around the globe, indigenous communities, governments, and environmental groups are realizing that human rights aren't enough to protect the planet. They're passing laws that recognize rivers, forests, and mountains as having rights of their own, rights that include the right of those ecosystems to exist and flourish. These actions are beginning to make a real difference. Find out more about this work by visiting the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights webpage at centerforenvironmentalrights.org. Randy Krakowski's book, Without Reservation, describes his spiritual awakening as a Native American. It's a powerful, life-changing story where Randy shares his journey into the realm of ancestral Native American connections and explores his encounters with Mother Earth. The book actually helps you how to reconnect with your ancestors to rekindle your access to ancestral wisdom and nature. Available in print, ebook, and audiobook format, Get Without Reservation by Randy Krakowski from all major booksellers. For more information, visit Randy Krakowski. Located near Shawnee, Oklahoma, citizen Potawatomi Nation is Potawatomi County's largest employer with a rich history and culture as a sovereign native nation. Learn more about CPN by visiting its website, which includes information on services for members, tribal enterprises, government and constitution, the newspaper, and much more. All at Potawatomi.org. <laughs> 
That's P-O-T-A-W-A-T-O-M-I dot org. Period poverty. If you don't know what it is, you should because you can help. One in four American women struggle to purchase menstruation products this year, resulting in missed school and even loss of income. The Native American women's nonprofit, Quek Society, cares enough to give Native American students and communities their period products, and they do it across North America. Please help women with your time, donations, or supplies to maintain their dignity and celebrate their strength during moon time. Visit QuekSociety.org. That's K-W-E-K Society. Don't get angry. Anger is a negative emotion that suppresses your immune system that may cause health problems. Make a positive difference by working together to protect and support your family, friends, and community. Take a break from the dark side. Uplifting and enlightening. Listen to the positive side of podcasts. HRNradio.com Welcome back to segment three of Indigenous Perspectives. We're talking with Savannah Carr Wilson from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, working with Indigenous peoples, First Nations on a variety of legal issues. Savannah, you've mentioned that some First Nations have been passing Indian Act bylaws to put their own COVID-related restrictions in place during the pandemic. Can you tell us how they've gone about doing this? Um, especially which groups in those First Nations communities have taken the lead on these important health issues? Sure. So this was a really interesting development that we saw happen during COVID. Uh, you know, COVID hit, and I think uh, all levels of government and also Indigenous governments were c- quite concerned about how to protect uh, their people from from COVID transmission, and, and perhaps particularly so um, some Indigenous governments, uh, especially those in like rural and remote parts of BC, uh, had high risk populations with you know uh, lots of other underlying health conditions, substandard housing, uh, and also just a lack of of medical facilities. So this was a you know really really important um, issue uh, for many of these nations. And they, they wanted to do things like put up um, roadblocks to, to govern, you know, who was coming in and out of reserve or make, you know, make rules, right? That if you're not a member and you're not a resident of this community, uh, you can't travel here during COVID out of a desire to protect the people living in that community because travel was one of the main vectors of how COVID was spreading, spreading around. And I think it also came out of a sense that our provincial and federal governments weren't doing enough. So these indigenous governments wanted to do more. Um, so then, but then, you know, you get to the question of how do, how do I, how do we do this? And to a certain extent, that's the lawyer's question of how do we do this? Um, but it was also the indigenous government's question of what's, what, what fits for us? Are we going to do this under our own inherent indigenous laws? Um, but what, what enforcement um, measures do we have? If someone doesn't agree with the roadblock, what, what do we do? Or are we going to use another tool? Um, and we saw some, some nations, uh, deciding to use another tool, which was, as you've mentioned, this Indian Act, um, bylaw. Now we already talked a bit about the Indian Act. It's, uh, this, this colonial piece of legislation that's been around a long time. And, you know, it created the, the Indian Act band and it gave that band certain powers. And one of the really specific things it, it said they could do was pass these bylaws, which are sort of like minor, laws about some really specific topics and one was contagious disease so that really you know no one thought about covid when that was being written in the law but it it certainly came to the forefront during covid and so we saw several first nations pass these indian act bylaws um essentially about covid to uh to to put all these travel rules in place in their communities and i think there was there was a lot of tensions with that because i think there's a real dislike of the Indian Act and, and many nations don't want to be using those, those bylaws because they're coming from this Western colonial piece of legislation. Um, but in a way, it was like the, the best tool they had in a pretty limited toolkit. Um, and, and the reason some nations chose to, to use it was that it essentially gave some teeth, um, to the rules that they wanted to pass about travel and quarantine, uh, cause they could do things like, um, 
uh, under legislation, say, hire their own bylaw enforcement officer, a member of the community whose job it was to go and enforce these rules. Uh, and that was a really useful tool. Um, it wasn't perfect, though. Uh, you know, I, I think, and this is perhaps a roadblock or an area for improvement or um, a difficulty that some of these nations ran into, is uh, it's still pretty unclear you know, if people don't listen to the bylaw officer, how do you enforce this Indian Act bylaw? Uh, it's a bit of a gray area. Um, supposedly, the federal police uh, in Canada, that's the RCMP, or the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who police a lot of our rural areas, were supposed to help. But in practice, um, uh, they would only do that with a court order. Uh, so, you know, I guess in summary, a lot of nations started using this tool because it was available to them, even though it was flawed. But we also saw in them using it that there's still a lot of roadblocks to it. It's still a really imperfect tool. Um, but it was a pretty unique and interesting development that happened during COVID. Were there any differences between the ability or the will of the First Nations people to enforce any COVID-19 travel restrictions against outsiders as opposed to their own tribal members? I think that certainly a lot of the restrictions were aimed at outsiders um, because there, there was a sensitivity to the fact that if, if members were traveling, maybe they were doing that for a, a good reason, right? Like in, in rural remote areas, you know, members often have to travel down to the big city for medical appointments um, or have to travel somewhere else to use a bank because sometimes these communities are so small, they don't have a bank, um, those sorts of things. So I think the real focus was on non-members and non-residents, uh, really essentially recreational travel, right? Like you don't need to be doing recreational travel to our community right now while COVID presents such a danger. And there was rules about members, uh, you know, if you do travel, you have to quarantine when you come back. But there was also often supports in place. So if somebody's quarantining, there'd be like a personal community shopper that would make sure that those those individuals were getting um, the food and medicine and, and whatnot that they needed. Um, there was people to look in on elders. Um, so there was various supports put in place for um, for members. So there, so there was d- differentiation. I love the explanation you're giving because it's deeply rooted in indigenous cultural values. We live across the river, the St. Lawrence River part time in Montreal from the Ganawago or Mohawk um, reserve. And they basically shut it down and they were interviewed constantly on the CBC and the argument that their governance body gave repeatedly and very eloquently is we respect our elders. We're protecting our elders. They are the conveyors and preservers of our culture. And I thought it was a really beautiful message, especially since in the mainstream press on a daily basis, there were horror stories about people dying in great numbers in elder care facilities, which in some parts of Canada were operated as essentially, you know, warehouses. So I think this was a, a as they say, the teachable moment for much of the population. Was that at all the case in your area? Absolutely. Um, I think that's a very eloquent um, explanation. And for many of these um, communities, you know, those elders are the last speakers of the language. So beyond beyond the amazing value that, that elders have in, in so many different ways, there was also a fear that parts of the culture and the language would, would um disappear if they were to pass away from COVID. Thank you for your explanation. This is a very, again, you know, upbeat message for all of us to be hearing. We'll take a break and be back in a moment. Five, four, three. Welcome back to the final segment of Indigenous Perspectives with Savannah Carr Wilson from Victoria British Columbia in Canada. And Savannah, um, we've talked about a lot of issues connected with Indigenous rights in, and changes in, among Canadian legal nations, among Canadian First Nations. Ah, start this one over. Sorry about that. 
Rights for Nature? Around the globe, indigenous communities, governments, and environmental groups are realizing that human rights aren't enough to protect the planet. They're passing laws that recognize rivers, forests, and mountains as having rights of their own, rights that include the right of those ecosystems to exist and flourish. These actions are beginning to make a real difference. Find out more about this work by visiting the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights webpage at centerforenvironmentalrights.org. Period poverty. If you don't know what it is, you should because you can help. One in four American women struggle to purchase menstruation products this year, resulting in missed school and even loss of income. The Native American women's nonprofit, Quek Society, cares enough to give Native American students and communities their period products, and they do it across North America. Please help women with your time, donations, or supplies to maintain their dignity and celebrate their strength during moon time. Visit QuekSociety.org. That's K-W-E-K Society. Listen up. The source for information and inspirational items about the struggle and wisdom of indigenous people is the Syracuse Cultural Workers. They are committed to peace, sustainability, social justice, feminism, and multiculturalism, and they create beautiful visual materials like calendars, t-shirts, cards, and more, including their greetings and thanks to the natural world, according to poster that offers daily grounding for our relationship to the earth and its many fellow beings. Get so many wonderful items. Go there now. SyracuseCulturalWorkers.com Randy Krakowski's book, Without Reservation, describes his spiritual awakening as a Native American. It's a powerful, life-changing story where Randy shares his journey into the realm of ancestral Native American connections and explores his encounters with Mother Earth. The book actually helps you how to reconnect with your ancestors to rekindle your access to ancestral wisdom and nature. Available in print, ebook, and audiobook format, Get Without Reservation by Randy Krakowski from all major booksellers. For more information, visit Randy Krakowski. Citizen Potawatomi Nation's Cultural Heritage Center, located near Shawnee, Oklahoma, features 11 immersive galleries with digital and interactive exhibits. Visitors learn about the tribe's history from origin to modern days and gain an understanding of citizen Potawatomi oral traditions and lifeways. Admission is always free. Open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturday 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Visit the Cultural Heritage Center on the web at PottawatomieHeritage.com Where positive people and radio unite. HealthyLife.net Welcome back to the fourth segment of Indigenous Perspectives with Savannah Carr Wilson. Savannah, can you comment further on the activities around the University of Victoria Law School and Indigenous related and Indigenous focused programs? Sure. Uh, I think a little bit earlier in this program, we, I mentioned the, the wonderful revitalization of indigenous laws um, that is is taking place in BC and in Canada. And uh, I think a lot of that work uh, seems to be happening at the the University of Victoria. Um, So the University of Victoria has an indigenous um, legal research unit. Uh, It's a program that's been running for for a number of years. I haven't worked directly with them, but I know about their work. And they, um, they're working directly, so they're a team of researchers housed at the university, and they're working directly with, uh, indigenous communities on legal revitalization. So they have a methodology that they follow and they work closely with those communities, um, to say work on, you know, a section of their laws and, uh, I think work with them to hear what their, uh, community stories are or their community um, legends, and develop those out as a basis for uh, written laws. Um, For example, say laws about water. Um, So it would be a whole community process where the researchers would go and meet with the community and in the end uh, sort of have further developed or reaffirmed um, what that community's laws on a particular um, topic are. so in loose terms, that's, that's their methodology and I think a very exciting uh, program that they're running. And then 
I, there was there was an effort for many years at UVic to set up a joint um, common law Indigenous law degree. So when I was when I was in law school, there was only one kind of law degree you could get, and that was the common law. So we learned about uh, you know provincial and and federal laws. Um, but but now UVic has actually launched a, a joint um, common law Indigenous law degree where um, I, I believe it's a mixture of, of Indigenous and non-Indigenous students. And I think it takes it slightly longer than um, the, the sort of the common law degree, it might be four years, but it's, it's very unique and it's, it's really exciting. Um, so say in a, a criminal law class, that's one of your core top, your core subjects in law school, everybody takes criminal law. Um, instead of just learning about the, the criminal code, which is our source of criminal law in Canada, you're going to be learning about the criminal code, but you might also be learning um, Cree criminal law. Uh, the Cree are, are one of Canada's Indigenous peoples and, and sort of how, how the Cree would approach a particular um, scenario um, using their criminal laws. Uh, and I, I think there's probably a whole lot more richness um, to this program that I I can't explain because I um, haven't been uh, intimately involved in it, but I, I do think it's it's really exciting, and it's it's um, producing this whole generation of students who are are fluent in a sort of Canadian uh, common law and statutory law, but also many different um, Indigenous laws. Have there been court cases where two bodies of law um, are? in conflict or where jurisdictions are in conflict? Uh, I, I think certainly, certainly there are. Um, I think there's, there's, there's often attempts by, by lawyers to bring Indigenous laws um, into the Canadian court process. Uh, I'm thinking a little bit about, you know, there was a lot of conflict over the coastal gasoline pipeline in Northern BC and uh, set several injunctions um, related to trying to remove protesters from up there. And I, I do believe there was an attempt in the court filings to bring in the sort of Indigenous perspective on evidence and so on, and some frustration when that didn't um, didn't happen the way the, the lawyers would have liked, and the court sort of more stuck to the, the Western way of, um, of looking at things. Uh, so, so there are, yeah, there are attempts to... To, to bring it in, but I, I don't know that there's there's really a good integration of um, Indigenous law into our court system yet. You referred to some of the pipeline issues um, from just reading in the news. I was intrigued with the fact that um, many of the protesters were water keepers who were traditional tribal chiefs, typically women, who were very, very assertive about protecting the land, even though the elected tribal council had, in a sense, signed off on the pipeline. This brings us back to this issue of different kinds of governance structures. Um, can you go back to that topic and elaborate a little bit? Sure. Um, this was, I know, a, a sort of a contentious and much reported on part of the, the coastal gas link pipeline conflict was that if I'm remembering it correctly, there there were um, certain communities, and I think they were um, bands, so Indian Act bands with the chief and council that were um, supporting or endorsing this project. And then there were um, other communities composed more of traditional or hereditary leaders who were in opposition. And so there was this question of, well, who is the leadership of this nation? Um, and uh, and that's a it can be a tricky question because as I explained. Um, with the Indian Act, you had this, this system imposed on communities um, where you'd have a chief and council who are now responsible for this very small um, reserve or piece of land. Uh, but then you, you still have this rich traditional governance structure that, that exists. So I think today there can be conflict between those two of, um, you know, perhaps there is that chief and council on that reserve, but the nation might see its territory as being much broader and there might still be traditional hereditary leaders um, in the community, and it's it's a it's a difficult um, it's a difficult issue that can that can certainly create conflict. So, would some of the traditional leaders have moral, if we'll call it that, authority over areas that are different from the 
more limited um, reserve lands? Is that how it works? Yeah. So if you, um, for, for example, you might have a, um, it could be a traditional governance structure. Um, and let's say there's a um, leadership and leadership would see their territory as being a very, very large area. And then within that area, there's reserves that the government has set aside for Indigenous peoples that are, are being governed by a chief and council. Um, so very small pieces within that larger traditional territory. Um, so I, I think if we could say, where does this conflict come from? Um, it comes in part from the, you know, the colonial government coming in and, and messing with um, governance structures and trying to put their idea of a governance structure in place on top of what was already really well-developed traditional governance structures so that today we have them existing at the same time and and some degree of, of conflict for some nations. Thank you. That's the clearest explanation of a story that I've seen muddled in the news on this side of the border for two years, and you you made it clear to us. Well, as we wrap it up for today, we thank Savannah Carr Wilson of British Columbia, Canada, for her insights and experiences on the topic of Indigenous people in Canada, their organizations, and their use of the legal system to protect their environment and their health. So, Savannah, miigwech. Thank you. Thank you. Located near Shawnee, Oklahoma, citizen Potawatomi Nation is Potawatomi County's largest employer with a rich history and culture as a sovereign native nation. Learn more about CPN by visiting its website, which includes information on services for members, tribal enterprises, government and constitution, the newspaper, and much more. All at Potawatomi.org. That's P-O-T-A-W-A-T-O-M-I dot org. Randy Krakowski's book, Without Reservation, describes his spiritual awakening as a Native American. It's a powerful, life-changing story where Randy shares his journey into the realm of ancestral Native American connections and explores his encounters with Mother Earth. The book actually helps you how to reconnect with your ancestors to rekindle your access to ancestral wisdom and nature. Available in print, ebook, and audiobook format, Get Without Reservation by Randy Krakowski from all major booksellers. For more information, visit Randy Krakowski. Citizen Potawatomi Nation's Cultural Heritage Center, located near Shawnee, Oklahoma, features 11 immersive galleries with digital and interactive exhibits. Visitors learn about the tribe's history from origin to modern days and gain an understanding of citizen Potawatomi oral traditions and lifeways. Admission is always free. Open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturday 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Visit the Cultural Heritage Center on the web at PottawatomieHeritage.com. Remember, help for a positive life. www.healthylife.net I hope this broadcast has given you time and space to reconnect with your roots in Mother Earth and with your ancestral roots as well. Before your busy day distracts you from this moment, I encourage you to take a few minutes to reach out and feel the presence of living flora and fauna, and perhaps even that of your ancestors. Allow yourself to touch their presence, capture that moment, and hold on to it. And if you will, write to me and let me know about your experience. I can be contacted through my website at randykritkowski.com, where you can also find transcripts and supplemental materials for all Indigenous Perspectives shows. Miigwech. Thank you for being a listener.